Gmail.com. One more time with feeling. Well, we're supposed to start at 7.30, and I think we're running a minute late. My apologies. But it appears I'm gaining mastery of the technology. We are streaming live on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and it all appears to be working. Oh my goodness, what a technological mess I have gotten myself into. But welcome everyone. Uh, it's summer, and if you haven't noticed, I have my new quarantine haircut. And uh, I am itching for good barbecue. And I don't know about you guys, but when Thanksgiving rolls around, I think about turkey. And when the 4th of July rolls around, I think about ribs. I think, you know, a lot of people are under the misimpression that barbecue is an American invention. It's not. It goes back to China. It goes back to caveman. It goes back all over Europe. Cooking low and slow with smoke. Grilling, of course, ancient technique. But ribs appear to be truly American. 
If you travel around the world, they're usually attached to the loin muscle. And Americans seem to be the only ones that peel those bones off and serve them separately. And uh, uh, when you take the ribs off, traditionally, historically, um, as we are led to understand, um, the enslaved African Americans uh, got these bony cuts of meat with lots of tush, tough sinew and fat when master got to eat high on the hog, which is the loin muscle, which sits on top of the ribs along the very spine, the back of the hog. Hence the expression, eating high on the hog. Um, thank goodness, because uh, these uh, s slave cooks figured out that you can make mighty scrumptious food out of these bones by cooking them at a very low temperature for a long time with smoke. And uh, what I thought we'd do is we'd kick things off tonight just talking a little bit about ribs and um, then um, wander into all your questions and answers and see where we go from there. Now, I am dealing with some new technology and uh, question and answer is going to go a little weird. Um, but I think I'll manage it. So let's start talking about ribs to begin with. First of all, I have an announcement. And this is important. If you come late to this meeting, you're going to miss out. We published a book about ribs this week. You know, back in 2005, when my neighbor challenged me to a rib cook-off, and I said, okay, you're on, and then I went to Amazon looking for books on ribs, I couldn't find many. In fact, I couldn't find anything on barbecue, and there was certainly nothing devoted to ribs. So I said, well, now, you know, I had just sold up my magazine about wine. Uh, let's build a little website about ribs, and let's call it Amazing Ribs, because it starts with an A. And in those days, there was no Google, and the search engines sorted alphabetically. So I would call it Amazing Ribs. I had one recipe, it was called Last Meal Ribs, because it's the last meal you want on earth, and we published it on AmazingRibs.com, and the rest is history. There's now a thousand plus recipes, 4,000 pages, Pitmaster Club with 16,000 members, the largest, by far, barbecue and grilling website in the world, and one of the largest, most popular culinary websites in the world. Just from my neighbors thumping his chest to come out and challenge you to a rib cook-off. Um, and I said when I started it, well, you know, I'm going to learn how to do ribs better than I know now. And then I'm going to publish a book. Well, it took me to 2016 to get this thing out, Meathead, which has some rib stuff in it. And a lot of other stuff, as, as many of you know. It's a really good book. I'm very pleased with it. It remains among the top-selling cookbooks on Amazon three years later, four years later. Um, 150,000-plus copies. Um, but this week, with the help of our my associate, Clint Cantwell, I finally published a book called Ribs, called Amazing Space Ribs, not Amazing Ribs like the website. Amazing Ribs made easy and it's on Amazon now it's strictly an ebook and it's a Kindle book and for those of you using Mac or uh, iPhones and iPads let me tell you the Kindle app runs great on all Mac applications on Android PC on everything you just download the app and you can get the book and why I'm telling you this is for today and tomorrow only, it's free. You can go to Amazon, go to tinyurl.com slash loveribs. tinyurl.com slash loveribs, and you can get our new book all about ribs. It sells for $3.99 starting Saturday, but we rolled it out this week, and it is free today on Amazon, so go get it.
And uh, that's your reward for arriving at this little session on time. Okay, well, um, the book contains a lot of information that I'll sh discuss loosely with you today. Um, uh, we, we need to start with very important basic key information in that there is no just such thing as just plain ribs. There's baby back ribs, there's spare ribs, there's St. Louis cut, also known as center cut, and there's rib tips, and then there's country ribs. And then there's other cuts like crown uh, roasts which have the ribs attached. So let's, let's make sure we're clear on the differences uh, because you may find them in the store and they're different in their treatment and the cooking and uh, how you handle them. Um, the most famous of course is probably baby back ribs and they're easy to spot because they're curved. They have a hockey stick shape and that's because they're attached to the spine and they curve down the side of the animal and they're maybe six inches long, five inches long, they're not very long but because they're attached to the loin muscle and the loin muscle is that big long muscle that runs right along your spine called the longissimus dorsi and that loin muscle is very lean whereas the ribs have a lot of connective tissue and fat in between them often when the butchers remove the butt bones from the loin muscle they leave loin meat on there and how much they leave on there is entirely up to them but often the meat on a baby backs lives on top of the bones more so than in between the bones and what lives on top of the bones tends to be lean because the loin muscle as you know that's where most of your pork chops come from it's a very lean muscle so baby backs tend to be on the leaner side that doesn't make them diet food no ribs are diet food. I hear people all the time tell me, well, I went to your favorite barbecue joint, and man, those ribs were fatty. I don't like them. And my answer is, wow, that's good. Go back. Um, fat is flavor, as you know. Um, I mean, they can be overly fatty, and if they're buying them incorrectly, they can be overly fatty. But basically, you want ribs to be fatty. You're not going to eat them every day but they, they need richness and flavor and uh, they should have fat. Now, as you move further down the side of the animal, you run into what they call spare ribs. Now, spare ribs start at the end of the baby backs. They, it's a big, you know, the whole rib section starts at the spine, just like on you. It starts at your spine and wraps around to the sternum, the chest area, and those ribs on the side are often called side ribs or um, spare ribs. Now that doesn't mean they're spare tires or leftover ribs. Uh, it comes, we think, from the German, but um, the spare ribs tend to be flatter, not as curved as baby backs. And by the way, baby backs don't mean they come from baby pigs or anything. They're just called baby backs because they're a little smaller. Um, spare ribs tend to lean, lay flatter so if you're going to cook them indoors and brown them in a frying pan, that's your choice because they lay flat and they're easy to brown, whereas baby backs are curved and they're hard to brown. So if you're going to brown, cook them indoors and make a, uh, a stew or uh, cook them in your oven, you want to brown them first, you want to get the side ribs or the spare ribs. Now the thing is, is these spare ribs, the rib bones end before the chest where the chest begins there's a lot of cartilage I hope you're watching the video here because I'm I'm massaging myself I'm showing you where the there's a lot of cartilage from here to here and from here on back is where the spare ribs are in the chest area that's the rib tips and by the way the, the new book which you can have for free if you go to Amazon tinyurl.com slash love ribs um, you'll see pictures of all these different cuts where they come from there's a chart and a graph and you can go get that on Amazon and we have a lot of this on amazingribs.com also um, but uh, the rib tips have a lot of cartilage there's not much bone in there 
there's little bony things but they're flexible they almost look like uh, plastic tubes um, the meat's very tasty it's very rich very fatty but it's odd because there's the cartilages are going every which way and you find yourself um, chewing and sucking and ripping and tearing whereas the rib bones are very neat and organized now if you chop off those tips what you have left is the st. Louis cut and it was probably first you know popularized by some butcher in st. Louis I prefer to call them center cut because the back the back ribs are the top the um, tips are the lower and the center cut is the st. Louis cut center cut just has pizzazz so the center cut if they're butchered properly is really a nice rectangular shape 12 to 13 bones perfectly rectangular shape very popular with the cooks on the competition circuit the Kansas City barbecue society competition circuit if you're gonna cook on the Memphis barbecue network or Memphis in May um, <laughs> my dog is thinking about ribs over here <laughs> uh, Sorry, um, they cook baby backs a lot. So, those are the main cuts of ribs. There's one more we need to discuss, and those are called country ribs. They're not ribs. They come from the shoulder area at the end of the rib section. There may be a rib bone in there, but most of the time, the bone that's in there is part of the blade bone, the shoulder blade. And you can tell it's kind of a T-shape. Um, and there's a lot of meat on them and it's a mixture of meat and fat and sinew but there's a lot more meat on country ribs than there is on spare ribs or back ribs but they need to be cooked differently because they really are not ribs they're chops and you want to treat them like you would treat pork chops now pork chops are best when cooked to 135 to 140 degrees internal temp USDA says take it up to 145 with an overabundance of caution, but at 140, you're going to be perfectly safe. 135 is fine. That's what you cook a steak to, 130, 135. It's the same concept, same muscle meat. Um, the, if there's any contamination or hazard, it's likely to be on the surface. There hasn't been any um, problem with parasites or... Uh, you know, the trichinosis is what everybody's worried about uh, from any commercial hogs in this country. But a couple of cases from homegrown pigs. Um, but 90% um, of the trichinosis nowadays comes from bear meat. Make sure you cook your bear meat properly. So you can, all the cookbooks, if you have old cookbooks, they all say cook your pork to 170, 160. That's shoe leather, trust me. USDA says 145 is okay now. And I'm here to tell you so is 135 to 140. It'll be a little pink in the center. But that's a, it's, it, that, if you haven't had a pork chop or a country rib cooked to 135, you've never tasted pork. I'm here to tell you it's an entirely different gustatory experience. You really need to try that. And you need a good digital thermometer to get there. Make sure you have a good digital instant read thermometer. And if you don't, go to AmazingRibs.com, click on ratings and reviews, click on thermometers, and find a good one. Um, the uh, Thermopop for 30 bucks. There's another one for 16 bucks, both of which we've given top awards to. So go get yourself a really good instant read thermometer, and uh, you'll never overcook pork again. Now, that's the the shoulder ribs or the shoulder chops or the country ribs the problem with baby back spare ribs side ribs and center cut ribs is that they contain so much fat and sinew that if you just throw them on a hot grill which is the way a lot of people do they're going to shrivel and shrink and contract the proteins and that's going to squeeze out a lot of the juice and they're going to get very tough you have to cook them at a low temperature. We recommend 225. 225 air temp. And remember, you're going to use either a smoker, which is always indirect heat, or 
a grill and you're going to set up a grill with a hot side and a not hot side coals or flame on the hot side nothing on the other side uh, and you're going to put the meat on the nothing side the indirect side where it's going to gently roast with warm air convection air flow you can throw smoke wood chips on the hot side and they'll get nice and smoky and that's a really nice addition but you're going to cook them indirect for baby backs need three to four hours st louis cut or side ribs and spare ribs five to six hours at 225 i know that seems interminable but it's that's what it takes to make them commercial quality competition quality tender juicy suck succulent so um okay the other steps in the process that are vital is you want to get salt down you want to get a half a teaspoon of morton's kosher salt per pound of meat now that's your normal rule of thumb for all meats half a teaspoon morton's kosher salt and we use morton's kosher salt not because they paid us or anything but because it's a nice large grain it's easy to pick and and sprinkle um, doesn't contain many additives and um, uh, it, it's pretty darn consistent um, so uh, it's also half as concentrated as table salt um, so if you're going to use table salt your rule of thumb is um, a quarter teaspoon of table salt per pound of meat for ribs you got to cut that in half because half of the ribs are bone so you want to use a quarter teaspoon of Morton's or an eighth of a teaspoon of table salt and just sprinkle them on there and if you can get them on there a couple of hours early because salt you've heard me say this before it's the magic rock it's just sodium and chloride two atoms when they get on the surface of the meat they get wet they get electrically charged they move down to the center and they help the proteins hold on to moisture and they enhance the flavor without altering it and so you want to get the salt down a couple hours beforehand if you want at the same time you can put down your seasonings but you can also wait till the end because sugar is 23 atoms it can't get in it'll get into the surface pores and the cracks and crevices go in a little ways it can't get to the center it just cannot and I'm not going to get into the details here um, if you want go read the science of rubs on amazingribs.com and explain how this whole thing works but you want to put a, a, a spice rub down there and most spice rubs are really pr pretty simple they're paprika garlic onion um, black pepper uh, if you buy a rub it's going to be half salt and you're going to be paying a lot of money for salt so you make your own go to amazingribs.com or get that free book that i just told you about and it the recipe for meatheads memphis dust is in there and I know a lot of competition teams and restaurants use that recipe so go get that and use that recipe and you're gonna put that on top of the meat and you're gonna put it on liberally you want to be able to see the meat underneath it but you're gonna give a good nice thick coat on top then the meat goes on indirect side three to four hours for baby backs five to six for other cuts and you don't have to flip them they're just going to sit there the air is going to circulate around them gently roast them throw wood chips or chunks on the hot side so you get some good smoke flowing keep the lid closed you can lift the lid and peek every now and then if you have to but it's better to just keep the lid down and uh when they're you think they're going to be done the trick is is a lot of people will t take a, a the bone and they'll twist the bone and if it's very loose in the socket there in the uh, in the rib that's a sign that it's done some folks use a toothpick test I like what we call the bend test I get a pair of tongs and I bounce the meat on a pair of tongs and it should crack you should see a big long crack on it, it should break if it breaks it's not the end of the world it means possibly a little overcooked but it should crack and if it cracks it's done so now you're gonna take these ribs and you're going to put a layer of sauce on one or two layers is all you've got a symphony going on here you have pork you have salt you have your spice blend and now the sauce and smoke so you've got all of these flavors going on don't drown it in sauce one or two coats depending on how thick it is that's all you need you trust me I know you love sauce 
We all suck the brush when we're done. It tastes fantastic. But don't go crazy with it. Give it a light coat. Let the other flavors shine through. And um, if you can, if, you have, if you're working with a grill, or if you're on a smoker and you have a grill, like a gas grill, fire up that gas grill, get it good and hot, and after you put the sauce on, throw it on the gas grill where it's really hot. What happens is the heat will caramelize the sugars that are in the sauce and they'll quickly start bubbling and sizzling and it'll alter the flavor of the sugars and other things and it'll really improve it. So we call it sizzling on the sauce and only takes a minute or two on each side and you're done. You want to put another coat on, go ahead, be light, be gentle, but that's it. You're done. Now, time to slice them. It's hard to figure out how to slice them when they're laying flat. It's hard to find the middle spot between the bones. So it's usually best to stand them on end and then you can find the spot to slice. But be careful. If a thing slips around, you can cut yourself. Okay? If you want, you can flip them over. It's much easier to cut them from the back side. Oh, and I forgot to mention the membrane. Oh my goodness. Um, a lot of ribs come from the store with a membrane on the back. It's the pleura. It's the membrane that lines the cavity where the lungs and heart and stomach are. And it can get leathery or rubbery. And you want to try and remove it. And I've got pictures on the website or, and in this free book that I just told you about. And you, you can peel that pleura off. It's not hard. You get a, a, a table knife, a, a, a butter knife, and slip it between the bone and the membrane and peel that membrane back. And usually you can get it all off in one peel. Paper towel in your hand, gripping that membrane really helps get you a grip on it. Some folks use catfish skinners. It's like a, a plier with very wide mouth. But whatever, it's not hard to get it off. And it's a nice thing to get off. It makes the texture of the meat nicer. Also, there's a layer of fat under there, and that fat layer will render as it cooks so the meat isn't quite so um, uh, fatty, greasy. And it's just a, a gesture to your guests and your company that uh, you respect them. You're taking it off. Um, restaurants that leave it on, I think, are just taking a shortcut. And even though the ribs may be good, I think, to me, it says, eh, I don't respect you all that much. I don't, just me talking. So, I think that covers the concept pretty quickly, the basic core concept. Now, the, the book that I just told you about that's free on Amazon has recipe for cooking them indoors in an oven. So, if you're stuck in a blizzard or you live in a dormitory uh, or a condo, um, there's a really good technique for indoor oven cooking, for um, cooking them in a slow cooker, and also for cooking in a frying pan. There's a really good um, um, a Mexican uh, technique in a frying pan. So we've tried to cover all the bases and should cover everything I've summarized here on the different types of cuts, the different techniques, and there's some really good recipes. And, um, uh, and 4th of July, you just got to serve ribs. Okay, now, I've got, give me a second here. To, I'm working with this new software. And I gotta figure out how to see your comments. Um, what does this button do? No, 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 no. Ha! Comments. Not available when using Switchboard Live. Okay. All right, folks. I am gonna tell you right now. Um, if you're watching on. Facebook, I think I'm going to be able to get your comments. I'm, I'm going to Facebook now, um, and uh, I'm pulling up Facebook, and I'll try to get those comments there. Um, I'm also going to try to get, okay, yep, yeah, we're there. Um, and now I'm going to try to, uh, uh, oh, look, Facebook is translating for me. How about that? I see the text showing up in translation. Um, now, how do I see the comments? Um, stand by. Or questions, I should say. Bingo! I'm there. 
Okay, now let's see if I can get... Um, oh, I'm hearing my own voice. Uh, let's see if I can get the YouTube questions. Huh. Okay, turn off the radio. The I have my computer piped through a, a radio speaker. All right, and st stick with me. I'm going to get there. Okay, we're getting YouTube up. And there are comments there. Okay, I got both Facebook and YouTube comments up. Let's start with Facebook. All right, now, I, I normally these things are slated for an hour, but they always run an hour and a half, and I try to get everybody's comments in. So let's just see how well I can do it. John Rogers says, hey, everything looks great. Okay, thanks. Uh, Billy Gilbert is uh, surprised about where High on the Hog came from. Now you learned something. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Holmes Lindell says he thought eating High on the Hog meant you were stoned and eating pork. You know, I got to tell you, when I was in college, when I was in college, kiddies, back in the uh, 1960s, you've heard of the 60s? You know, they say if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. My parents told me, you know, smoking that stuff will lead to harder stuff. And they were right. Now I smoke pork. Uh, okay. Uh, Bruce Blair's uh, talking about how well he likes his pit barrel cooker. You know, Bruce, we just did a big seminar um, on Zoom on pit barrel cooker for the members of our Pitmaster Club. Um, those of you who have not taken advantage of our free 30-day offer for Pitmaster Club, you should check it out. The Pitmaster Club is really cool. And a week from tonight, we have a live seminar with the famous uh, Dr. Barbecue himself, Ray Lampy, as a guest star. And uh, we'll be talking both about ribs and many other things. Um, we do wonderful things for the members of our Pitmaster Club. Helga Lara Palsidotir. Oh boy, I'm sure I butchered it, Helga. Um, she cooks the best ribs in Iceland, she says. That's cool. Um, Billy Gilbert. Uh, came in late. Um, thank you. This is, There's beef ribs. Yeah, you know, I didn't talk about beef ribs. Most of us, when we think of ribs, we think about pork ribs. But I got to tell you, beef ribs are a whole nother animal, pardon the pun. Um, and beef ribs are really interesting. There are two different basic core cuts. There's the beef back ribs. And they almost never have meat on top because they're attached to the loin muscle, just like the hog. But the loin muscle on a steer is the, prime, is the, is the, is the ribeye. And ribeye meat is some of the most expensive meat. So when they pull those rib bones off, they take all the meat off of them. So all the meat on rib backbones are um, between the muscle, uh, between the bones. But it's really good. And uh, they cook in about three hours. They're awesome. All they need is salt and pepper. And they're a lot of fun. Move further down the animal and you get into the side ribs on the steer. A lot of people say they can't get these. What, you, what you've seen them on the internet, they call them dinosaur ribs. They got like two inches of meat on them. Those come from uh, a cut towards the front of the animal. And write this down if you really want to get great beef ribs. Tell your butcher. First of all, they're not carrying them. You won't find beef ribs in your butcher's shop because there's not enough call for it. It'll, it'll, it'll spoil. But you can. this is really important, really important. This is the most valuable thing I'm going to tell you tonight. Your butcher should be willing to order anything you want. If you go there in the morning when they're when the head butcher is there to greet the trucks, they tend to arrive early and leave early. Ring the bell, ask for the head butcher, the assistant butcher, and say, I'd like to order NAMI 123A. NAMI 123A. NAMI is North American Meat Institute, and they publish. Hold on, I'll get it for you. 
this. This is the Bible. This is the North American Meat Institute's Meat Buyer's Guide. You can buy it from it, Nami. Uh, it's like eighty-five hundred bucks, but it's great. It's got every beat, every cut known to man, and the, the diagrams, details, and every butcher should have them. And Nami 123A is the plate ribs, the short ribs. They're about eight inches wide with four bones and eight inches tall, and the one or two of these bones have two inches of beef on them, and they're awesome and we talk about how to cook them on AmazingRigs.com. Uh, Kevin Holmes Liddell says he cooks bear meat at 135 medium rare sous vide perfectly safe um, you want to you didn't say how long um, Kevin the key is time and temperature um, yes you can you can probably kill trick at 135 I'm not sure what the I, I do have the number I don't remember it it's on amazingribs.com and you should check you should check make sure 135 is safe for trick um, but you need to get enough time to kill them all and uh, you'll get a, a, a beautiful piece of medium rare bear meat that is safe but you've got to got to be careful about time and temp um, there's a frightening video by a TV star who does a hunting show and he goes out hunts bear meat they shoot it and they all sit around the campfire and eat it and then he almost dies um, weeks later because he's full of and 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 once trichinosis this will scare the shit out of you once trichinosis gets into your muscles you can't get rid of it it lives there for the rest of your life okay uh, several of you guys are saying you like my Memphis dust recipe. Thank you. Uh, Byron McSpud says, if you're looking, you're not cooking. No, you're wrong. Go to AmazingRibs.com and read the article. It's a really interesting point. Let me do it shortly. There's warm air inside of your smoker or your grill. The warm air heats the outside of the meat. But the warm air doesn't heat the inside of the meat. The warm air can't get into the inside of your meat. What cooks the inside of your meat is the outside of the meat. The outside of the meat retains energy like a capacitor or a battery. And so you can open the hood and all the warm air comes out. But guess what? The outside of the meat is still loaded with energy. Now it will feel a dip, but we show charts. Lift the lid. The outside of the meat barely notices and the inside of the meat doesn't notice it a bit. It doesn't affect cooking time. Close the lid, the air builds up back to temperature, nothing is lost. Has almost zero impact on cooking time. If you're looking, you ain't cooking is a myth and we bust it clearly with charts and graphs on AmazingRibs.com. Um, what was the website for the book again? David Phelps asked. I'm going to make you wait till the end of the show, but it is a I'll give you a hint. It's a Kindle book. Um, next time you'll get here on time. Um, ah, Ryan Crouch is hardcore. He goes, dry rub, no sauce. Yeah, that's Memphis style, and you got to be sure to get it right. KC Classic Sauce, another recipe of mine, says Byron, Byron McSpud. Um, uh, so uh, that... that um, uh, recipe is a nice barbecue sauce. Okay. Uh, Costa Rica. Hello, Rodrigo Morales Vargas. Ah, yeah, this, this is the second what we're calling deep dive books, the rib book. And I'll tell you now. It's on Amazon. Go to tinyurl.com slash loveribs. Or just go to Amazon and search on me, Meathead, and you should find my book, Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling. You should also find one that we did in January on sous vide Q, which is sous vide with barbecue, and that's $3.99. I mean, we're, doing, we're starting to do these mini books, single topic, ebook only for $3.99. We've done two, and we're really proud of them. They're really good, and $3.99. Ah, one of my some of my favorite sauces for ribs. Um, you know, I am a huge fan of yellow mustard sauce from uh, South Carolina 
but I still prefer good old-fashioned red Kansas City sauce on my ribs. Um, and um, in the case of our website, my KC Classic recipe is just a classic. It's really good on ribs. Um, uh, cooking spare ribs on the grill five to six hours. Uh, on the grill... In the indirect heat zone, at 225, yes, five to six hours. At 250, less. At 300, less. At 200, more. Important temperature and time. They go hand in hand. Oh, somebody just thanked me for the free book. How nice. And somebody is thanking our healthcare heroes. Yeah, I'll take that for, not for me, but for them. All right, we're a little off topic, but I'll deal with it. Um, thoughts on taking the fat cap completely off pork shoulder and brisket to maximize the area you season. Do you risk drying out the meat? No. And in fact, go to AmazingRibs.com, search on fat cap. And you'll find a whole article I did on this. The fat cannot penetrate the meat. Meat is 70% water. Fat is oil. Oil and water don't mix. You put a leave a... And when you got a half inch thick fat cap on there and you put your seasoning on there it's all going to get peeled off everybody's going to cut the cut the fat cap off at the table side so take your fat cap down to a quarter inch in general it'll shrink during cook, cooking down to an eighth of an inch or less that's not too much fat for most people you put the seasoning on top of that you'll get a bite of seasoning a bite a little bite of fat and a lot of flavor and it won't dry out with a little bit of fat Carolina sauce, yes or no, asked Bob Lawrence. I love Carolina. Well, there's no just not just one. You know, there's South Carolina sauce, which is mustard-based, and then the Eastern Carolina sauces, which are vinegar-based. And I do like them a lot. I prefer them on pulled pork than on ribs. But, yeah, I mean, I'll eat ribs without sauce. If you've cooked them properly, they're really good without sauce. What do I think about wrapping ribs at the end? There's a technique that a lot of competitors use. Uh, it's called the Texas Crutch. And uh, as the ribs go up in temperature, they can slow down cooking, hitting a place called the stall. If you wrap them tightly in foil or butcher paper, um, it prevents the evaporation that cools the meat. Um, and it can slightly steam the meat, slightly braise the meat, because liquid gathers in the, in the, um, in the, inside the uh, packet, um, and uh, tenderize. Uh, it's a good technique. It makes the meat slightly more tender, slightly more juicy, but it also really softens the um, bark. And the bark is the dried out surface. The exterior surface is in warm air, and it'll dry out. It can get like um, jerky. And uh, a lot of us really like that part. It's crunchy. It's got all the rub in it. and it's dry. If you like crunchy rub, uh, crunchy bark, then don't wrap. Don't use the Texas Crutch. If you're really into tenderness and juiciness, try the Texas Crutch. Ah, yeah, John Rogers asking, uh, was I working on something about cooking a wok over a charcoal store starter? I wasn't doing a book on this. It's going to be a chapter in my next big book you know i got one big book i got another big book working on and i got a chapter in this and yeah it works um the problem is you get a chimney charcoal starter um you light all that charcoal and when that stuff is lit you've got the back end of an f-16 it's well over a thousand degrees and if you've cooked with a wok indoors you know even on a gas stove it just doesn't get the wok chinese restaurant hot and a charcoal chimney will and you put your wok on top of a charcoal chimney. It's perfect. It sits right there. It heats the bottom. One problem. If you put the wok on top of the charcoal chimney, it can slowly extinguish the fire. So what you got to do is, I, I did this. You get a, a, um, a, a Weber charcoal chimney, which has got a nice wide mouth. And you either cut some V-shaped slits in it so that air can get in underneath the wok and over top of the charcoal or drill some holes in it and you, you just got to get some oxygen 
into the coals when the wok is on top. Do that and you've got an awesome wok cooker. Um, Steve Fisher says he's having trouble getting the uh, damn membrane off. I've got some video that might help you. Um, I, I think, all right, look, at it's like opening a bottle of wine. You know, that damn cork is a pain in the neck. You got to sit there, put your arms at your side, close your eyes, relax your shoulders and go, I am smarter than the membrane. I will defeat the membrane. You've just got to get psyched. I mean, many of us whip them off with no trouble. Once you get it, um, you'll you'll get it. Um, you start way near the end. Get that knife in there. I've got pictures on AmazingRibs.com, step by step. You'll get it with practice. Keep practicing. It's not a sin to leave it on. It just has a funny texture. Sometimes it's really hard and leathery. Sometimes it's rubbery. And a lot of people prefer it off... You know, in Japan, they have a style of cooking called kaiseki, where um, everything is very precise. Same food that they cook on a Tuesday, but they cook kaiseki on weekends or sat, uh, for, for company. They just are more precise about it. They're going to do matchsticks. Every little sliver is exact size. And what it is, is it shows your guest you respect them. I went to the trouble to make this perfect. And getting the, uh, getting the membrane off says the same thing. Ah, Billy Gilbert says his Costco sells ribs without membrane. That's cool. Many stores do, but you normally can't tell because they're on top of that styrofoam tray. You can ask the butcher, and in fact, actually, I should mention that. Oftentimes, the butcher will do it for you. If you buy the ribs, you can say, hey, is the membrane on or off? And if he says it's on, you can say, would well, you do me a favor, peel it off? They might just do it. I mean, there's nothing you can do better in life than make friends of a butcher. More important than making friends of a stockbroker. Um, cook two slabs of ribs, one for yourself, and one, take it back to your butcher around 11, 11 11.30 when they're all getting ready to break for lunch. And say, hey, you guys that took care of me, here's a slab of ribs that I cooked today. They'll love it, and they'll never forget you, and they'll take good care of you. Um, I tried getting it off beef ribs. Sucked. No, don't bother on beef ribs. You can't get it off beef ribs, and if you do, the meat will fall off. You've got to leave the membrane on beef ribs. Uh, there's just no way around it. Give a shout-out to Facebook group, Sous Vide Food and Fun. Always looking for new members. Okay, there you go. Now you got to tell your people about our book, Sous Vide Q, $3.99 on Amazon. Can you leave a hanger steak in a marinade too long? No. And yeah, well, all right. Here's the deal. Like I said with the rub, salt can penetrate deep. Nothing else can. And the way you can prove this is get yourself a pork loin, you know, a section of pork loin or a turkey breast. Marinate the heck out of it overnight, two days. Cook it. Cut it in half. Wipe the cut face so that none of the surface contaminates the interior. Look at and taste the center. There's no marinade in there. Garlic, salt, garlic, sugar, um, all of the pepper, they just cannot penetrate. They're a surface treatment only. Your marinade is really a surface treatment. It can get into cracks and pores, maybe penetrate a 16th, to an eighth of an inch. So if you're doing something like a skirt steak, well, an eighth of an inch is almost a quarter of the thickness. But if you're doing a turkey breast or a chicken breast or a ribeye inch and a half, uh, or what was the steak you were asking about? Um, hanger steak. Uh, they can run about an inch or more. Um, it's not really penetrating. And if you cut into it and taste the center, there's no marinade. So, you know, you're, you're just treating the exterior. Now, marinades serve a purpose because there are flavors like juices and other things that you can't get on your spice rack. But one of the problems with marinades is they're wet. So when you put them on a hot grill, they can't sear the meat until the water evaporates. So now you're steaming the meat. 
once you've steamed the meat and you've burned off all the water, then you can brown the exterior. Brown is beautiful. Brown is the Maillard reaction. Brown is important for flavor, um, and especially if you're cooking a steak. Um, now, the flavors that are left behind after the water gets off are really good, and they can, they can caramelize and be very, very nice. But you've got to be aware that you are hampering the browning of the meat when you marinate it. Yes, well, NAMI 123A, that is your beef rib official name. Kevin Holmes Little says you can download the Meat Buyer's Guide for free. I don't think so. I'd like to see a link to that. I think they, I don't, I'm not aware of it being able to download it for free. You may be able to see a page or two or three or five, but I don't think you can download the whole book for free. It's an expensive book. Any tips on making ribs on a big green egg? You know, I have a love-hate relationship with big green eggs. They are great for low and slow cooking because they heat up, they hold heat, they don't fluctuate. They're absolutely perfect. Um, but um, um, they're not great for doing a steak and some other things, uh, I think. They're really good for pizzas too, by the way. Um, I'm not going to get into it right now because big green egg owners are... Um, they are devoted to their machines. They are absolutely convinced it's the world's greatest smoker, cooker, everything. And if I dare say anything slightly critical, and I just said I love them, but as soon as I say but, they, they think I'm an idiot. So, okay. Bill Gabriel, yes, I have a glass of wine. Of course I have a glass of wine. I always have a glass of wine when I'm talking to you guys. I need a drink. Um, all right. You guys over on YouTube, don't... Don't despair. I'm working my way down the Facebook questions. I'll be over there on YouTube in a minute. Um, um, Robert Atkins asks, when cooking baby backs and wanting to go unwrap the whole cook. And I, by the way, I don't wrap at home for home. If I was competing, I would wrap it because, you know, $10,000 prize or something. Every little bit counts. But for home, I just don't bother. Um... He uses the slow and sear. It, it, by the way, if you have a Weber kettle, there is a cool tool called the slow and sear. Slow and sear. Slow and sear. Go to our website and read about it. Slow and sear. It is absolutely required that you buy one. It allows you to turn your Weber kettle into a very good smoker, and it improves your searing. All right. So the question: How do you control them from getting too dark on the edges? Or is wrapping always essential? Okay, all right. So the way to prevent them from getting too dark on the edges is keep them as far away from the hot side as possible. Keep that water trough full of water. Rotate them so that they're not always all one side facing. Or use rib racks. Rib racks will hold the rib slab vertical. And with a rib rack, you can get four or five slabs on there. Um, and if, they, if it persists, then dial down the temp. Um, 225 may be too hot for it. Ryan Crouch did the homework. He looked it up. Trick is killed at 138F. So whomever it was that asked about trichinosis at 135, um, Ryan is suggesting that you turn it up to 138 or, to be safe, 139 and 140. If you're cooking bear meat, please don't. Just go to YouTube and Google... Um, Hunter, TV Hunter, bear meat trichinosis or some combination like that. You'll get this video. The guy just stares at the camera and tells you what went wrong. All right, Brian, Barry Smith says it's 137. So we have two opinions here, but they're both higher than 135. Okay. Neftali Ortiz says, my wife doesn't like me using sugar on my seasoning because of her diet. I've actually got the math on this. Um, Meathead's Memphis dust is about one-third sugar. And you're going to use a tablespoon on either, either side, I think, is roughly. 
So on a whole slab of ribs, <coughs> you're getting about two-thirds a tablespoon of sugar. You're not going to eat a whole slab of ribs. Most of the people aren't. <coughs> so cut it in half. On a half a slab of ribs, you're maybe getting a third of a teaspoon, a, a, a tablespoon of sugar. But much of that drifts off during the cooking process. So you're down under a third of a tablespoon. The glycemic index is, and I think I, I talk about this in the book. I do. Go get that book. <coughs> Pardon me. The glycemic index, really low. I mean, way below eating a slice of bread. Way below. So, you know, the, there's very little sugar in a rub. If you want to leave it out, leave it out. The beauty of the sugar, though, is it helps build the crust and flavor. Um, you've just got to go light on it. Oh, heck yeah. Uh, Kyle Lang's using fresh herbs in the Simon Garfunkel. By all means, we're herb gardeners too. And fresh herbs are great. You just got to use twice as much fresh herb as you do dried herbs. Dried herbs are more concentrated. But sure, fresh herbs, go for it. Um... And if somebody just apologized for going off topic on brisket. Hey, any questions are good. We don't have to stick to ribs. I just wanted to kind of have a rib theme and and talk about it and promote our new book. Um, what about the dark spots? They look like blood. How to prevent them? Not sure what dark spots you're talking about, but most of the blood is removed during the slaughter process. The ends of the bones, bones are filled with marrow and marrow where is blood made. The ends of the bones turn black because that is blood. Um, if you see some blood spots on the surface, that's rare. Um, but if you see them, I don't think they'll hurt you. People eat blood. I mean, I, oh, I'm a huge fan of blood sausage. Um, uh, it, it shouldn't hurt you. Uh, cover them over with sauce. Um, Ribolator. Brian Garner's asking around. You know, I've tried them. I'm not impressed. This is a device, it's a rotisserie that has like four or five trays. You put the ribs and it rotates them. And I, I just don't get it. I don't see that it improves. Now, it, it, it can allow you to get more ribs on a tubular smoker like a Weber Smoky Mountain. But um, on other cookers, I just don't see the need for them. Go to AmazingRibs.com and read my review on the rib later. Um, you know, uh, John Sheely is saying in a cheap attachment to the Weber chimney, to, well, you, you just got to get air to the coals. And the only way you're going to do that is to cut holes in. I suppose, now that you mention it, one could make a collar to sit on top of it that has holes in it. But I mean, you got a drill bit, do, dude, don't you? Every red-blooded American out there who doesn't have a drill bit, raise your hand. I don't see any hands. Turkey fryer burner works good for a walk. Yeah, absolutely. 150,000 BTUs. Um, Craig, I'm, don't, I'm not following your question. Any technique for placing ribs on the smoker to produce the best end results? You mean the end result? Or the results on the ends. I had a couple of racks where the end of the bones are at an angle, making it difficult to cut between. Not sure what you're talking about. Baby backs often have a section of what is called the chine, and that is part of the spine, and that makes it hard to cut through them. Um, and um, uh, that's just the way they're butchered. They have the chine on there. When you're fiddling with the bones you can often feel if there's a chine there you can cut it off or score it cut through it they make it hard to cut what's my opinion on wet brining pork ribs I'm not a huge fan of wet brining anything um, I mean you gotta need these big buckets and as I've said, people put not just salt, but they put black pepper and garlic and everything in there, and none of that gets in. Only the salt gets in. 
dry brining, and I'm pretty sure I'm the one that coined the term dry brining, which is simply just sprinkling the salt on the meat, works just as well, and it's so much more efficient. Hey, Tim Hausler's in Aurora. Uh, John Rogers is sending me a Google link. What is it? I'll check it in a second. Do smoke tubes make a big difference in making ribs on a pellet grill? They can make a, a, a difference. Um, pellet, first of all, I don't call them grills. I'm stubborn about that. I call them smokers. I mean, they're really designed just like your indoor oven. The fire and flame is down under a sh flat piece of metal. So there's really no exposure to direct infrared energy, which is what you need to sear. Um, so it's an oven. It's a smoker. So I call it a, a smoker. The lower the temp, the more smoke. Um, but yeah, if you can put more smoke into the air, the problem with pellet smokers is they're so damned efficient. They burn the wood so beautifully that you're getting really clean smoke. And if you want more smoky flavor, particularly Texans, I'm betting maybe you're from Texas. Um, Bunyan McSpud, are you? Is that really your name? Bunyan McSpud? Are you from Texas by any chance? Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if you are. Uh, they, they want more smokiness. Um, so yeah, these, these tubes will produce more smoke. Um, if you've got a pellet grill, you should probably recognize you have a string quartet, not a brass band. And your smoke flavor is going to be elegant, delicate, and complex. It's not going to be loud and strong and proud. Um, if you want that, you got to get a log burner. But yes, using the tubes will help. Can you use steak seasoning to steak after dry brine? Yeah, if it doesn't contain salt. If you've dry brined and then you add a steak seasoning and it's loaded with salt, now you've oversalted it. Uh, Joe Moffat asked, do I have a Cuban sandwich recipe? I don't think I have one on the website. I got to get to work on that. What's the difference between the NAMP and the NAMI book? They changed their names. Used to be North American Meat Producers. Now they're the North American Meat Institute. If you can get the NAMP book, you might find a used copy from an older vintage cheap. It's just as good. It may not have the latest cuts. You know, the Las Vegas steak. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> Tim Morgan. Ever thought about doing cooking demos down here in the Pig Islands? We don't eat people now. <laughs> That's good, Tim. You know, I'm not going anywhere for a while. I'm an old man with uh, underlying conditions, as they say. Uh, I uh, I work from home. I've been working from home for 50 years. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to continue to work from home for a while. Uh, all right, well, several of you have arrived late. And you're asking questions that I answered earlier. I'm going to be very quick about them. Um, dark spots might be blood, uh, Jonathan Jarrow. I can't tell because I don't know. I'd like to see a picture to see what he's talking about. Um, the book, no, it's not the big book. But in the past year, we have published two small books, one on sous vide Q, and this week we published one on ribs. They're both ebooks only, and they're both on Amazon. And for today and tomorrow only, the Ribs book is free on Amazon at tinyurl.com. Writing this down, Gary, Gary, Sear, Gary Sayers, tinyurl.com slash loveribs. It's right there for free. Go get it. Uh, question, Weber Smoky Mountain versus Offset Smoker for Whole Brisket. Um, uh, which one will produce a better smoke ring? Oh boy, um, that's a really lengthy question. Both of them are competent cookers. Both of them do well. I've made great brisket on both of them. Um, offset smoker is a very broad term. Weber Smoky Mountains, very specific. I know what device. Offset smoker, there's a hundred of them, and there's the cheap ones you buy at Home Depot. 
that are garbage and then there's really good ones like the Lang that are fantastic so I don't know which one you're referring to if you're talking about something similarly priced to the Weber Smoky Mountain it's probably garbage uh, then I would take the Weber Smoky Mountain as far as quality of smoke ring that has to do with nitric oxide in the atmosphere and a lot of variables that go way beyond go Google go look up smoke ring on amazingribs.com have a whole article about what causes smoke ring okay Kevin little Kevin Holmes little he's dug deeper Trichinella begins dying at 120 yes a lot of guys start at that temp it takes 20 hours to kill it at 135 it's a matter of minutes under an hour and at 135 you're still medium rare so there you go um, I you know but these other guys are saying 137 138 why 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 take a risk you know I know you're doing sous vide just be careful do really careful research because like I said if these things get into your muscles they're there for life you cannot take a shot there's nothing you can do to get rid of them they will bother you for life what's wrong with adding five degrees to the cooking temperature ah when cooking um, beef ribs is the goal to break down the membrane no you can't when you now when you do beef ribs in a stew like in France or you know in a slow cooker that membrane will break down and it will add tremendous flavor to the stew and that's why short ribs are often stewed and they're wonderful and believe it or not even though we're a barbecue centric site I have a recipe for beef ribs stewed in a slow cooker French style so check it out Rempy Greg Rempy hey guys we are blessed by the presence of the great Greg Rempe, the master of the barbecue um, podcast. Um, if you've never listened to him, um, uh, um, you need to uh, Google him. And every Tuesday night, he has two hours of really educational, interesting podcast um, and uh, uh, required listening. You want to check it out. Um, and uh, he's here in our presence. All bow down to the great Greg Rampy. And now I lost this question. Oh my God. Facebook is jumping around. This goddamn thing jumps around. Oh God, I've lost Greg Rampy. Shit. How do you how do you lose my hero? Oh my god. The questions list is jumping around on me, and it's really hard to hard to for me to keep up. And I just lost Greg somehow. And I'm scrolling, 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 scrolling. Yeah, there he is. What is your favorite grilled pineapple recipe? <laughs> you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> All right. I get to be on Greg Rempe's podcast once a month. What is it? The first Tuesday, second Tuesday? I forget. Let me look at my calendar. Um, second Tuesday every month, I think. Um, He's got some great guests. And uh, I once said something that I will stand behind. My favorite thing on the grill is pineapple. God, well, I'm gonna, I got a sweet tooth. But you slice pineapple and grill it till it's got some crosshairs on it, some marks on it, and those sugars caramelize. And oh my God, that's fantastic. And then you can serve it on a pie or... Um, on ice cream and I, I so I made the mistake of rambling on Rhapsodic and Rempe's podcast about this and he's never letting me forget it he's just sticking the his sharp elbow in my ribs okay I think we are working our way just to the bottom of uh, the uh, Facebook question so let's let's go over to YouTube let's see if I can get there there it is and there are questions okay Logan Kassoff asked my favorite cut of meat boy that's tough you know I mean the easy answer is like what's your favorite kid you know um, there um, if you placed me 
equal distance between a perfect ribeye steak and a perfect double wide lamb chop um, from a rack of lamb. And it's the exact same a a muscle. It's the longissimus muscle. It's the back muscle. It's just smaller on the lamb. Perfectly cooked. I would die of starvation trying to decide which one to eat. I love them both. Um, uh, now, if you ask me what's my favorite muscle on the steer, there's one called the spinalis dorsi. And go look up S-P-I-N-A-L-I-S on AmazingRibs.com. It's a slightly um, curved muscle that wraps around the eye of the ribeye. And you've seen it. When you get a ribeye steak, there's the center muscle, which we call the eye of the ribeye, and that's the longissimus. Then there's a thick layer of fat, and then there's another layer of muscle that lays on top. And that layer of muscle that lays on top is heavily marbled, and it almost always overcooks. So it's well done, even though the, the, the center is medium rare. And if you do a roast, it almost always overcooks. Uh, now, this is, a, and I've got a video on this and an article on this, so this is really cool. If you're a beef lover, you want to go buy a full rib primal. Now, it's going to cost you 300 bucks, but you get seven bones wide, and you get, like, maybe, if you just sliced them up, a dozen thick ribeyes out of it. So you're getting a pretty good deal price-wise, depending on what grade of meat you get it. Then, and I've got a whole video of this process, you're going to take your knife and you're going to cut the bones off the rib primal. Now you have beef back ribs, and that's a whole meal. They're fantastic. And so you set them aside. Now you have two muscles, the eye of the ribeye, the, the longissimus, and the spinalis, which wraps around. You can peel that spinalis off just with your hands. You can get your fingers between the muscle and that fat layer, and you can peel it off. When you're done, you have something that's about the size and shape of a salmon fillet. It's maybe 12, 14 inches long, maybe 6, 8 inches wide on one end, and it tapers to a point on the other end. Um, it's maybe an inch thick on one end, half inch thick on the other end. It's like a salmon fillet, a big salmon fillet. This stuff is god-awful good. It's awesome. It's like um, Wagyu beef. It's the most heavily marbled, and you want to grill it hot and fast. It's not thick. You can't reverse sear it. You just want to get the hottest damn flame you can, salt and pepper, grill her off, and bring her in. Slice it up and watch your guests go straight to heaven. It's just awesome stuff. Now, what you have left now is this big tube, and it's maybe 24 inches long, and that's the longissimus. That's the eye of the ribeye. And you can cut these up, and they're about 12 ounces each, and you can cut them into maybe a dozen or more ribeye steaks, boneless ribeye steaks. And they're perfectly round. They're going to cook really evenly because they don't have bone in the way. And, they, and they're just awesome. So I've got a whole video of how to do this butchery. And there's an article of it on AmazingRibs.com. And the video is right here on YouTube. Okay. And it's really a good technique. And um, I do it all the time. And it, it, you can save money that way by buying this big slab of meat. <laughs> Eric Villegas is uh, commenting sardonically about my quarantine haircut um, hey Wisconsin checking in you know I, I was just on Wisconsin Public Radio a couple of weeks ago and July 3rd here we go 3 o'clock July 3rd I'm going to be on Wisconsin Public Radio I think they're out of Madison um, so uh, tune in oh and he's complimenting my brat recipe my god it doesn't get any better than that a uh, Wisconsinite complimenting my brat rest first of all he knows I'm in Chicago and everybody in Wisconsin hates the Bears and everybody from Chicago for gypsy cabs from Wisconsin to compliment a Chicagoan it he must have had to screw up every ounce of courage he could 
and it's a good thing nobody's looking over your shoulder. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Saul Galeno, greetings from Brazil. Hello, Brazil. You guys know how to cook. You know, you got you guys now. You know your meat. Oh, and D. Lewis is in Canada. Boy, the uh, YouTube channel is loaded with uh, furners. No, Guy Lassad, he's congratulating me on the Hall of Fame. I didn't get in this year. This is two years in a row I was nominated. Insiders tell me I was this close, but I didn't get in. Maybe next year. Um, extra tips for making ribs on a big green egg. No, the, um, the, if we're talking about um, pork ribs, everything I just described, you know, um, peel the membrane off, salt them up a few hours before you cook or overnight, get a good rub on top, uh, put them on the egg, use your diffuser plate to make sure they're not directly above flame. Um, uh, low and slow, go for 225. Do not trust the thermometer on your egg if all those dial thermometers first of all it's in the dome and your meat's down below um, second of all all these damn thermometers they put in grills and smokers they go to the lowest bidder and they're just not very good and dial thermometers are not terribly accurate and they're slow um, get yourself an electronic digital thermometer that has a probe that you can lie down next to the meat and you put the probe right next to the meat so it's feeling the same temperature as the meat not the temperature in the dome unless you're going to eat the dome um so don't trust the temperature in the dome it can be way off in some cookers hot air rises so it's a lot hotter up there in other cookers because the vent is up there it's cooler um it really varies so just get something that sits right next to the meat and make sure you're monitoring the meat temperature, not the dome temperature, and you'll be fine. Uh, eggs are great. Now, the issue with the egg, and this is one of the reasons I, I, I struggle with it, is that now you've, you're all done cooking and you got the sauce on and you want to sizzle on the sauce. You want to get direct infrared energy to pound on that sauce and caramelize the sugars. To do that, you got to take the ribs out, put them in a plate or a pan, then you got to lift up the grate, put that aside. Then you got to get to get the uh, deflection plate or whatever they call the damn thing out of the way. Then you got to put the rack back in and try to get it as close to the hot coals as possible. And then you can put the ribs back in and you let them sizzle for an I for for a couple of minutes on either side. It's not that big a pain. You can do it. It's just that it's easier on most grills to move from the not hot side to the hot side. That's all. The other thing about the egg and Kamados, and I'm not picking on just the egg, is that Kamados are so well insulated, you can't turn the temperature down. I mean, they don't respond to rapid, you know, on a Weber kettle, if I want to turn the temperature down, I close two vents and within 10, 15 minutes, the temperature is taking a nosedive. Um, changing the temperature on a Kamado is like turning a, a steamship. How do I recommend cooking a boneless leg of lamb? All right, this is a tricky one because boneless leg of lamb, the, the whole trick to cooking is your thickness of the meat. And you, you're going to have, when, and when they remove that bone, the exterior is smooth, but the interior is like mountains and valleys. And some of it's very thick and some of it's very thin. I like to grill it. Now, if it's got really thick places, I'll start at a low temp just to warm it in the center. But I want to get dark brown, crispy, crunchy, and especially on those ragged surfaces, you can get really great chunks of meat there with, you know, maybe a little char here or there. Um, I, I have a rub recipe um, uh, called um, uh, sheep dip. Uh, I know sheep dip means something else in the farming world, but it's called sheep dip. And, it, it, and there, there are a couple of lamb recipes, rub recipes, that work really well. Of course, they have garlic and rosemary. Those are the two things that always work, work well with lamb. Um, and um, uh, you want to salt it in advance, then get your rub on it. Uh, then if it's not too thick, hot temperature, bring it off at 135 to 140. For steak, I like it 130 to 135 medium rare. It's kind of rosy red. Um, lamb, I don't mind if it goes up a little pinker. Um, but uh, that's me. 
Um, and um, uh, it, and uh, something else to look into is something called a board sauce. And that's, or a, um, what do they call it, chop sauce. Um, you're going to get a whole bunch of fresh herbs, whatever's fresh in the garden or in the store. Get whatever fresh herbs you can and chop them up. And then put them in a cup with some oil, throw in some chopped up garlic, onion, whatever the hell you want, hot peppers, and stir them all up. And then you pour them on top of the cutting board. When you bring the meat out, you lay it right on top of this oily, herby sauce. Now, you would think it would take over, but it doesn't because fresh herbs are not really strong. And you're going to slice the meat and roll it around in this oiled herb. You're going to get the oil, the fat, the flavor. It's just awesome. It's called a board sauce, and it's in my book, and it's on AmazingRibs.com. Um, hey, Ted Kubel's in Bridgeview, right nearby. I go down there for when I want um, uh, halal. A, a, a lot of um, uh, really good um, uh, restaurants that uh, service the um, Muslim community down there, and uh, they know how to do. Uh, they they do a lot of uh, grilled meats in there down there. Really good meat placement in a vertical smoker. Place the ribs top shelf or bottom. Uh, place the ribs at 225. Take the temperature, top shelf or bottom. It's the temperature that matters. In Brazil, it ain't easy to find briquettes. Isn't that interesting? We can find those, uh, find those wood charcoals. I think he means lump. Um, you, you can cook with lump. I, I people who know me and have heard me um, talk have said that I know that I'm, I'm I prefer briquettes to lump. And the reason I do is that each briquette is precisely the same size. Each one has been thoroughly carbonized so that there's no remaining cellulose or any other wood materials in there. They don't smoke. Um, I, I, tr I use briquettes for heat and not flavor. I use wood for flavor. When you cook with lump charcoal, some of those lumps can be very large, and in the center, they're not carbonized throughout, so you're burning wood. You're getting smoke from whatever type of wood it was. They snap, crackle, pop. You also have little tiny pieces and big pieces, so they're not even sized. They cook unevenly. Um, there's not a steady airflow because the little pieces can get in between the big pieces. And worst of all, I have found some god-awful junk in my bags of lump charcoal metal plastic all kinds of stuff lumber it's clear that some of those pieces are from lumber so here in the states where we have a lot of briquettes and people who don't use briquettes fear that there's some sort of poison in them because they do have additives um, but the biggest additive is um, uh, just a um, oh gosh I'm drawing a blank what is it uh, it's a binder it's just um, cornstarch um, but if you don't want any binders, there are several brands that are pure char, pure wood char. Um, Kingsford has one. I think Royal Oak has one. Weber has one. They're just pure, unadulterated, no additives. So go that route. Um, and I write about this. Go to my website and look up um, combustion. Look the article about combustion up, and I think you'll find my discussion of charcoal opportunities options there oh well we have one person from bridgeview another one from burbank illinois all my neighbors are here mark roseberry says he learned about the slow and sear from amazingribs.com and he best decision he made yeah it's a great tool for the web of kettle and sosa 3d third sosa third uh, likes log burners me too um, uh, log burners are difficult to manage. They require a good deal of time, energy, effort, and skill. But I think they make, um, if you have good logs and if you're good at managing your fire, they make some of the best tasting food there is. Ah, Ryan Lloyd. Good question, Ryan. Uh, 
And nothing's off topic, by the way. We're in free for all session, so we're not limited to ribs. Anything is up, open up. Charbroil Commander hasn't been used in about three years. Suggestions on cleaning it up. Um, okay. First of all, what the heck is wrong with you, Ryan? You haven't used your grill in three years? All right. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. It's your dad's, and he hasn't used it, and he gave it to you. Um, in any case, yeah, you want to clean it. Um, I do have a whole article on cleaning grills. Um, but one of the first things you want to do is try to fire it up. Um, and the fire will burn off any spider webs or dust or grease residue and gunk. Get it get as hot as you can. Burn off everything that you possibly can in there. And then um, scrub it down good. Get some steel wool, a good wire brush. Um, uh, some soap, some solvents. Be careful about using um, poisonous solvents on the cooking surface. But it doesn't matter if there's a little soot or carbon buildup on the dome or in the drip pan. You don't want grease in the drip pan. Get all that out. And you don't want any grease on the underside of the cooking surface, the grates. Um, make sure that burns off. You scrape it off. Burning grease is not um, tasty. I know a lot of people fire up their grill and there's grease on the underside of the cooking grates and they fire up their gas grill and they see all that smoke belching out of there and they think, oh boy, we're smoking tonight. That's grease smoke and you don't want it. So try that. Go look up my article on how to um, uh, clean up the grill. And you want to do what we call the bread test. You want to look for hot spots. You buy a loaf of white bread and you spread it out on the surface, turn it to medium, and um, after a couple of minutes, look underneath, and as they're browning, when you see them toasting, then turn it off, flip them over, and take a picture. And you'll see one or two of them are dark black, one or two of them are medium brown, and one or two of them are pale. And that'll show you where the hot spots are. The other thing is you want to look at the burners um, and make sure all the burners, often gas grills have a cover over the burners. Um, take those off and watch the burners and see if all the holes are open. That is, if there's flame coming out of all the holes. If some of the holes aren't open, if they're clogged, you can get a paper clip and, and poke those through. Um, you want, ideally, in the best of all possible worlds, blue flame, not orange flame. Or blue flame with a little tip of orange. The bluer the flame, the better. If your flame is really orange, then you have to adjust the oxygen and gas mix. And that's at a place called the, um, uh, what do they call it, the uh, Venturi, which is right behind the dial. Behind the dial, there's a little place that's got a slot. You can figure it out. you got to lay on your back, maybe. But you can see where the, it's like the carburetor. The air and the gas will mix. And you can usually rotate it. You might have to loosen a screw to add more air or cut back on the air to um, get the proper gas-air mix. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Ryan Lloyd. <laughs> Hi, Reese. Excuse me. Uh, this is a tradition between Ryan and me. This, this drawer here bothers Ryan. Are you okay, Ryan? That's... Anybody notice I got a cool new chair? A, a gamer's chair. Okay. Yeah, um, Blue Dog Ron says he's called it the cap on the ribeye, and I forgot that. I call it spinalis, which is the Latin name for the muscle. But yeah, it's commonly known as the rib cap. Absolutely. Um, so if you're looking for it, some butchers will actually sell rib cap. Uh, it's hard to find it, but if you find a butcher selling rib cap, you can often buy rib cap steaks. They're maybe six, eight ounces is all, but oh my goodness, they're good. Nope, here we go. YouTube is jumping around too. A decent website to buy beef online. Really hard to find brisket and whole ribs in the New York City area. No, it isn't. Um, I mentioned this earlier. You might have missed it. Um, you can go to your butcher, your grocery store. 
if it's a decent grocery store with a decent meat department. They're not going to put brisket in the meat counter because nobody is coming in. There's no demand for 18 pounds of beef. They don't stock it. They don't carry dinosaur ribs. They don't carry um, uh, pork belly. You go there in the morning when the head butcher or the assistant head butcher is there to meet the trucks. You ring the bell. They come out and you say, can you order me a brisket? And if you're lucky, and what you should be able to, he might even ask you, you want choice or prime? And uh, I can have it here for you by Thursday. So just go to your butcher and order it. Um, they can get whatever you want. The warehouse that they buy from has every cut of meat known to man. But they don't put it on the shelf because it'll just rot. So you got to ask for it. If that doesn't work, we do have a page on AmazingRibs.com where you can get really good artisan meats. Um, for example, um, um, Allen Brothers is one of my favorites. Um, uh, they, uh, they sell a wide variety of meats um, from USDA choice to prime to well-aged, dry-aged, wet-aged, uh, beef mostly. Uh, they do sell lamb, pork. They've got some heritage hogs. Allen Brothers, uh, they sell mail order. Um, Snake River Farms is another. Um, Crowd Cow is another very good one. I've got links to all of them. Just go to AmazingRibs.com and look up. If you search for beef, you're going to find a bunch of beef recipes and stuff. But you'll find the article eventually. T-Rock. Doc 21 in Oklahoma. Hello, Oklahoma. Gypsy Cavs is making fun of my bears. He said your team is terrible, and I almost want to. What do you mean? The guys who work for me are great. Oh, you mean the bears. Mark Roseberry um, followed my instructions on uh, the, the beef prime rib, and he had the uh, roast for dinner and the rib cap for breakfast. Man, you know how to live. Rib cap for breakfast. That's awesome. Um, what is in my glass? Oh, the damn thing jumped. I didn't catch your name. Oh, there you are. Uh, Tira, Tira, Doc, 21. I can't read all these abbreviated names. The, the nice thing about Facebook is you've got real names. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but in a previous life, I was the wine critic for the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune. Um, so I'm a wino, and we drink wine with di dinner every night. And uh, it's a tradition when I do one of these, I bring a glass or three with me. Um, th this is a Tuscan wine called Il Pocione. Um, 2017, 50% um, Sangiovese, 30% Merlot, and 20% Cab, which I guess makes it a, uh, a Super Tuscan. Um, pretty nice. Um, I, I, um, I talked about how knowing a butcher is a really good thing. Um, knowing a wine merchant is a really good thing. I worked in a liquor store for many years. <laughs> And uh, got to know my customers' preferences, and I have a great wine merchant, and uh, she knows my tastes. And uh, when uh, I place an order, I ask her to put together a case of mixed red and a case of mixed white, keep them all under $15 a bottle, and uh, if I find something I like, I'll uh, come back for some more. Tim R. is saying thank you. That's very, in elaborate terms. Thank you very much, Tim. Jean-Marc Demare, I've seen you. I've seen you over on Facebook. What are you doing over here on YouTube? You can get Wagyu brisket in your neighborhood for eleven ninety nine a kilogram. That isn't bad for Canada Day celebrations. Oh, and you're going to celebrate the 4th of July up there. Okay. Hey, any excuse for a party. <clears throat> All right, T Rock Doc, T R Doc. I'm sorry, I'm just don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, is it is a physician? Oh, there's the doc. 
uh, and he likes the science. Yeah, me too. Um, you know, um, I, I, you know, I always, I've always had a strong interest in science, and that's what we've had fun doing. And I think, you know, it's 2020. Um, uh, we're in a highly technological society. Um, people don't want me to tell them, do this, do that. This is step one, step two, just do what I tell you. They want to know why. And uh, what happens if I skip step two? What happens if I switch white sugar for brown sugar? So we, uh, we try to answer that. And plus, I mean, I'm just curious about why we do things. And as you know, if you've bought the book, we bust a lot of myths in the book. <clears throat> uh, Gary Bluong uh, likes Pinkaha, Pikanha. It's his favorite cut. It's a wonderful cut. And pecanha is um, is a cut that is frequently butchered so that there is a thick fat cap on it, about a quarter inch to a half inch. And it's one of these fat caps that gets very tender, and if you gr grill it properly, it can get crusty. And the, you, you don't mind eating that fat. I know, I know. This, this is a uh, <clears throat> one of those movies where... Uh, uh, some kid at the table with Chevy Chase says, you can eat your fat, but the fat cap on Picanha is really tasty, and it mixes well with the meat. Um, I know that's grossing some of you out, but if you, if, if you go to a Brazilian um, restaurant, <clears throat> especially these restaurants where it's all you can eat, they cook Picanha. You've seen it on a skewer. It's kind of a curved piece of meat. I've got pictures. Google it on our website. Look it up. Picana. P-I-C-A-N-H-A. And it's curved. And it's got a fat cap on it. It's really tasty. You can do it at home. Uh, my buddy Troc Doc. Tar, tar, I give up on your name. Doc. I'm going to call you Doc from now on. He's a single malt guy. This is your first ever live stream. This is the first one, one we've done on, on YouTube. Um, uh, this technology, dude, I'm just trying to learn how to do it. Stover 3. Yes, you missed the pineapple talk. <laughs> and Lex misses my glorious locks. Right. My wife actually says she likes me better with the short hair. Well, I think that's the end of the YouTube list. And let's see if anything major has popped up over on Facebook. Oh, um, Kevin Holmes Little asks if I know Tim Hani. Yes, I do. Uh, he's the one that taught me about umami way before anybody ever spoke about umami. I mean, we're going back 25 years. Okay, well, uh, George Phillips asked, do I ever use a pellet uh, grill? Pellet smoker? Uh, yes, I do often. Um, I do it when I use recipe, do recipe development because they hold temperature perfectly. And if I'm going to give you a recipe and say you need to cook five pounds of this for X number of hours at 225, I better get a good answer. And Stow Stover, yes, I love pineapple wine. All right, well, I think I've got most of the questions. I see a couple of others, but typically... I schedule these for an hour, and uh, that brings us to 8.30, and we have never wrapped up in less than an hour and a half, 9 o'clock my time, and it's 9.06, and uh, I'm an early-to-bed, early-to-rise kind of guy, so uh, I think I've got 90% of your questions on both Facebook and YouTube. We are streaming live. I don't know what's going on over at the Tweeter. I'll have to check. We had some issues connecting to the tweeter let's let's just see how that's doing um no i don't think we're streaming to the tweeter um but um this was fun um and uh i i i, I hope you will um uh, take me up on my uh proposal that um fourth of july is a ribs holiday uh that uh, we all uh cook turkey on thanksgiving the fourth of july should be ribs and if you want some good tips um, go to tinyurl.com slash loveribs. That'll take you to Amazon, to the new book we just completed on cooking ribs, both indoors and outdoors. 
all the different cuts, all the techniques we can think of, some good recipes. Um, and uh, it's downloadable and it's free today and tomorrow only. After tomorrow, it's $3.99, which is pretty close to free anyhow. Um, let me also encourage you to go to AmazingRibs.com, sign up for our email newsletter. We send out notices whenever we publish new articles, new recipes, new product reviews. Um, and uh, we also have a new newsletter called DigestThis.News or Digest This News Bulletin. And it covers the whole world of culinary from farm to fork um, because the world of food is changing rapidly out there. And we love everything, not just barbecue. And this covers everything that's going on on the farms, the factories, and the grocery stores in the food world. And uh, take our offer for 30 days free in the Pitmaster Club. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there, free magazines, free books, um, discounts. Um, I mentioned Allen Brothers. They offer discounts to our members. Um, I think Crowd Cow has too. Um, so go check out the Pitmaster Club. You can take 30 days free uh, if you sign up, and uh, we have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So essentially, if you don't like it after 59 days, you can get your money back. You had 59 days for free. So there. And uh, we'll see you last Thursday of the month, next month. Um, next Thursday, the first Thursday of the month, we have a uh, happy hour for members of our Pitmaster Club. And uh, Ray Lampy, Mr. Dr. Barbecue, is going to be our guest. And uh, we'll be doing a Zoom webinar for that one. So I think that's all the announcements. Um, I wish you a happy and uh, contemplative 4th of July. Uh, may we never see another like this one again, but may we think about what is so special about this country and uh, living to see the 4th of July. Um, salute! Ah.